Well, good morning, New Hope. Glad that you're here this morning. Glad that you made it in safe. And if you're on live stream, welcome as well to New Hope Community Church as we kick off this new series called Under the Sun, based on the Old Testament book by Solomon called Ecclesiastes. Have you ever been out in the sun and you thought to yourself, I don't have to put anything on, I'll be okay, right? Only to find that at the end of the day, you're very much not okay, sort of like this guy, right? Have you ever been there? Most of us, if we're honest, we'd be like, oh yeah, that's been me, because it has been me. And you like to, you try to cake on the aloe, you know, try to, you know, tame it down a little bit, but you, you go out in public and people are like looking at you, and you're like, dude, dude, what, what happened? You know, it's just pretty obvious, right? Well, I think it's a little bit of a picture of life, right? We think that we got it under control, but yet we get burned. We think that we have things going our way only to wake up and realize that we really don't have life by the tail and that we've really been grabbing the wrong tail, the wrong relationships, wrong addiction, wrong career, wrong experiences, wrong spiritual beliefs, the wrong look, the wrong material stuff. And we need to admit our, to ourselves that under the sun, we've been burned. We've been burned. The Donahue light world view is one of a linear life. When a certain number of years have elapsed, it comes to an end, and that's it, period. It's a pathetic picture of living. But people seldom consider their life until it's maybe towards the end or something hits the fan. In the old movie from 1991, The comedian, Billy Crystal, in the movie City Slickers, is a boomer who is trying to figure out life. He's an advertising guy who gets ad spaces for the radio. His son asks him to come into his classroom on Father's Day to explain what he does. But as he's looking to explain what he does, he starts babbling about what life really looks like to the kids. And so let's watch this clip because I give, think it gives us great insight to at times what our life may look like. Value this time in your life, kids, because this is the time in your life when you still have your choices. And it goes by so fast. When you're a teenager, you think you can do anything, and you do. Your 20s are a blur. 30s, you raise your family, you make a little money, and you think to yourself, what happened to my 20s? 40s, you grow a little pot belly, you grow another chin. The music starts to get too loud. One of your old girlfriends from high school becomes a grandmother. 50s, you have a minor surgery. You'll call it a procedure, but it's a surgery. 60s, you'll have a major surgery. The music is still loud, but it doesn't matter because you can't hear it anyway. 70s, you and the wife retire to Fort Lauderdale, start eating dinner at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, you have lunch around 10, breakfast the night before, spend most of your time wandering around malls looking for the ultimate soft yogurt and muttering, how come the kids don't call? How come the kids don't call? The 80s, you'll have a major stroke. You end up babbling to some Jamaican nurse who your wife can't stand, but who you call mama. Any questions? <laughs> I mean, isn't that the reality a little bit? Like, like okay, there, there, there's life in a nutshell, right? There it is. There it is. I mean, in reality, we all start the same. We take a breath, and we all end the same. We take a last breath. So what matters? Does the middle matter, the, the dash in between our first and our last breath? I mean, this is what Billy Crystal in the movie City Slickers was trying to figure out. And as we go through the book of Ecclesiastes 
over this next five weeks. This is what Solomon, as well, is trying to figure out. What in the middle really matters? What is the meaning of our life? And so this morning, I just want to introduce to you the first three verses in the book of Ecclesiastes in chapter 1 to get this overview of what we're wrestling with and what Solomon is wrestling with. Because the first verse in chapter 1 gives us the words of a searcher. If you're following your outline, the words of a searcher. He writes in Ecclesiastes 1.1, it says, The words of the teacher, son of David, king of Jerusalem. Solomon describes himself as a teacher. A teacher is one who collates all kinds of information and then presents it to other people. And so if you're a history teacher, you collate all the history of the world or your particular niche of history, maybe world history or ancient uh, Greek history or whatever, you collate it all, gather it all together, and then you present it to other people. Here Solomon is doing this for us. But we could also say, I think, that he's not just a teacher, he's also a searcher. These are the words of a searcher. As we go through the book, he is what? He's searching for meaning. Obviously, he is writing about his previous search, but the word searcher was who he was, and I think it is really who we are today. We are searchers. I want to show you another brief clip here to give you this picture that maybe how we don't often view it, but how really on a daily basis we are searchers. Let's watch. A strange dream. I was walking through a golden temple beneath a dome of glass and through chambers of splendor filled with so many objects that the heart so desires. I saw miracles of human skill and artistry and flawless beings who seemingly lacked nothing. it appeared they were all searching for something. Such strange creatures. You know, if we're honest with ourselves, every time we roll out of bed in the morning, we are searching for two things. Throughout our day, we are searching for that which will bring us pleasure and that which will reduce our pain on a daily basis. So after your time here today, this morning, you're going to go out and you're going to either go to lunch somewhere, you're going to make lunch at home, and what are you going to choose to eat? You're going to choose that which will bring you pleasure, right? Because that's what we seek after. If you're a commuter in the room, Tomorrow morning, if it's still snowing, tomorrow morning, you are going to try to find a commuting route that will bring you the least pain. That's what we do. All throughout our day in our decisions, we try to seek what will bring us pleasure and reduce what will bring us pain. And we're in this search. And so when we look at what Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes, it's really not just this book of all these ancient philosophies. It is very much up to date, and it is relevant for what we are going through today. I mean, you hear the kind of stuff that he writes about, 
on talk radio, on podcasts. You read it in books. You see it on sitcoms. You listen to it on TED Talks, reality TV. You talk about it over coffee with your friends. So in this book of philosophies by which people attempt to live life, Solomon brings them all under consideration and examination. And so he brings us these words of a searcher. But secondly, he brings us the words of a student. In verse 2 in Ecclesiastes 1, he responds and he says, after his life, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless, Everything is meaningless. Solomon is considered to be one of the most wisest and wealthiest men ever to live. If we read back in the Old Testament, in 1 Kings chapter 3, after his father David dies, God comes to Solomon, who is going to take over the leadership of Jerusalem, the nation of Israel, and he says to Solomon, Ask me for whatever you desire, and I will give it to you. Ask me for whatever you desire, and I will give it to you. When was the last time God showed up and asked you that question, right? I haven't heard it yet. I'm in line, though, but I haven't, no, I haven't heard it yet, right? And so then Solomon responds, and he says, Give me wisdom so that I will know how to lead this great nation. He doesn't ask for long life. He doesn't ask for wealth. He doesn't ask for the death of his enemies. And because he doesn't ask for that, God not only gives him wisdom, but he gives him all that as well. So Solomon brings then to us this experience. In the documentary that I watched three weeks ago on minimalism. Minimalism is this life of living with less, this life of contentment, this life of like actually living within your financial means. Minimalism. And there was this quote by Jim Carrey, and this is what he says. I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so that they can see that it's not the answer. Did you catch that? I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so that they can see that it's not the answer. Kerry got a lot of pushback for this quote because people are like, oh yeah, easy for you to say because you're rich and famous. You got it all. But in reality, think about it. He can make the quote because he is rich and famous. He's been there, done that. He's experienced it. And he's telling us now, out of his experience, hey, it ain't the answer. I can't tell you that. I'm not rich or famous. But he can. He's been there, done that. I like the quote that says, a wise man learns by the experience of others. An ordinary man learns by his own experience. A fool learns by nobody's <laughs> experience. Right? Right? So as we look at the content of Ecclesiastes, we're looking at content from a person who is a scholar, but first was a student in what he is writing about. He experienced it. So it would be wise for us to pay attention through the rest of this series what he is trying to tell us. But also, Solomon is limited as well because he's bringing this learning from his own human perspective, from his experience, his secular wisdom. He isn't God. He isn't God. So Solomon uses the word meaningless no less than 38 times through his writing. That is why Ecclesiastes is so practical and so up-to-date. The word meaningless literally means emptiness. Emptiness. 
Friday, I was called into our county jail to visit with a 40-year-old gentleman who was beside himself. And I sat across the table and listened to his journey. We had a great conversation, really liked this individual. And we had this great conversation about him just sharing his journey about throughout life, trying to fill this void in his heart with sex, with drugs, with experiences, with money. And him sitting across from me and saying, nothing seems to be fitting. Nothing seems to be working. And he's grasping for hope in life. Wondering, what is it, right? And so Solomon's bringing this to us. What is going to truly satisfy us? You see, everybody, it seems, in our world is trying to make wealth work. They're trying to make sex work. They're trying to make power work, experiences work, looks work, accomplishments work, stuff work. But according to Solomon, who was a student of all of this, nothing will work. Nothing in itself will bring lasting satisfaction. These experiences are material items. They're limiting. Alexander the Great, seeing Diogenes looking attentively at a parcel of human bones, asked the philosopher what he was looking for, why he was looking so in intently at this pile of bones. And Diogenes replied, that which I cannot find. The difference between your father's bones, Alexander the Great, and those of his slaves. Man, maybe in this life, they had different positions, but overall, they're the same. There's really no difference. They're probably both trying to pursue what they thought was like there. Once I get there. But in the end, you can't distinguish bones, one from another, a king from a slave. And so Solomon was trying to educate us through this book. He's bringing us words of a searcher. Man, I've searched like you're searching. He's bringing us words of a student. I've been there, done that. And then lastly, in verse 3, we see he's bringing us words of a skeptic. In verse 3, what do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? What do they gain? I mean, he's coming off as this skeptic of one who doubts. Hey, I'm not sticking with the status quo. You know, what do we really gain, really, from all we do? What matters? The concept of the word gain in the Hebrew language here is that which is left. That which is left. I like how one individual put it. After we have sucked dry all the immediate delight, the joy, and pleasure out of something, what is left over? What endures? What will remain to continually feed the hunger of this life for satisfaction? Did you get that? I mean, after we have sucked dry all the immediate delight, joy, and pleasure out of something, what is left over? What endures? What will remain to continually feed the hunger of this life for satisfaction? I think this is the right question. That's a great question. It is a question we're all asking. Is there anything that will really minister, satisfy, continually meet my need? Is there a key to this continual pleasure or this ability to come to a place of true peace and contentment? in this life. It's 
Solomon brings to us over this book and this series his viewpoint as a searcher, as a student, and as a skeptic. And he tells us that it is limited to what? Under the sun, which is the name of this series. Over and over again, 29 different times, he uses the phrase, under the sun. Under the sun, what we see and experience raises the question to us, is this really all that life is about? Is it merely an empty pursuit of that which never satisfies. You know, a couple weeks ago, I was down at the Minneapolis Boat Show, and I saw boat dealers there that I'd never heard about. Never thought, I mean, it's, I was an hour and a half into the boat show, and I finally saw, oh, Lund. I recognize that. You know, I was like, whoa, you know? And like the pontoon today, I mean, you remember like the pontoon yesteryear, you know, float your boat, you got a few chairs in there and a, a you know, 30, 40 horsepower motor on the back and you're going down the, the lake and that. I mean, today, pontoons, I mean, each cup holder has its own light show to light up your drink to the music. And there's these light strips around the pontoon that flash off the water. And I'm like, whoa, unbelievable. You know, like we need that. Like we need that, right? For $120,000. Seriously. Yeah. I mean, we used to have this 40, 50 horse on the back of the pontoon. Now you have four 300 horse on the pontoon. I mean, if you want to ski, you don't even have to leave your recliner. It'll drag the whole house. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. And we all sit here and, and we're like, oh, that's ridiculous. And we think, what I got now is fine. Until you walk by it and you're like, hey. whoa. That's why I drove the Camry down. I didn't bring the, the Suburban because I couldn't drag anything back. That was the, <laughs> see, I set boundaries for myself there and stuff. And that, but it's the reality, right? Because we, in life, we always believe that there's this there or that there's something that eventually is going to bring the satisfaction that's going to last. Is going to be left over and fulfill. And Solomon is coming to us through this book this series and saying, no. I'm bringing to you what I've learned as a searcher and a student and a skeptic. And so I want you to meditate on this quote as I leave and before the worship team comes up from C.S. Lewis from his book, Mere Christianity. And this is what he says. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy... The most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Consider that quote and ask yourself through this series, where's my heart at? What am I putting my purpose in? And what matters? And in a moment, the worship team will come out to close us off. But give that consideration.